Alex, thanks for having me here. Thank you so much for coming on the show, my friend. I truly appreciate it. I'm excited to get into to, to weeds with you about the, about your your life's journey and and your NDEs and all that. But first and foremost, how did you how did you get to the point that you had your first NED? Because I, from my understand, you were ice climbing. So, so my first question: Why ice climbing? <laughs> <laughs> That's a, really, that's a really good question. Just, let's just start know, it right off. Why I, ice I climbing? I'm just saying. I don't think anybody's ever asked me that question before. Am I blushing? I think you are. I think I am. I feel We've like we started it. this off. Very Wait a minute. Um, We've yeah, so this off sense great. of adventure. Um, I've been. I, I I was a Boy Scout from early on, and we winter camped. And I and I skied since I was a, seven years old. And so I was on the National Ski Patrol. And I was a, I, I was a Boy Scout until I was 18. Oh, so I did the Explorer Scouts because I loved backpacking and camping. And so a lot of time in the wilderness in New England, which is where I'm from. And that particular year, I spent a lot of time in the wilderness out west in the Rockies and then Montana, Wyoming. And so I kind of I'm oriented outdoors, but I'd never I'd never ice climbed. I had rock climbed. We have climbing here in the east. I did some climbing in the west. I, I didn't really what what the question part of the question you're asking you probably don't realize is why didn't I go back to Boston to see my family during spring break because right. I, mean, <laughs> I was running away really basically I was not going home for a very good reason and I needed an adventure to justify my staying out west and so I went to the outdoor club and I found this guy and he wanted to do an ice climb but I'd never done ice climbing but he had just gotten certified as a lead climber and and he had a lot of wilderness experience in the winter. And so we decided that we would go backpacking on skis, living in snow caves for eight days and, and finish up with a ice climb. And so that's what we did. So we went into Alberta. Uh, we we're kind of on the British Columbia, pardon me, the British Columbia, Alberta border. We went into British Columbia to go on our snow caving. And then we came back to you obviously have been there if you're if you're gushing over it. No, I'm just I just I've heard I've, I haven't I haven't personally have not but I know many friends of mine who have so I know very I know the area. Well, oh, it's so beautiful. It's, it's stunning. Oh, my stunning. God. Stunning. Totally. I want to go back. I think I'd like to do a motorcycle ride or maybe an electric bike ride from Jasper to Banff. Sure. <laughs> In the ice. No, I'm joking. In the ice, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, well, the spikes on the I was 21. I was 21. Okay, so that explains a little bit more. You're 21 because you're 21. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're like, yeah, you, you're indestructible. You're indestructible at 21. So that makes a lot more sense. Okay, so you're so you're right. You're ice climbing, and what actually happens during your climb that goes awry for yourself? Well, I make a mistake before I even begin my climb, and my mistake that I before I began the climb was that I had only one ice axe, and you have to have two. And so instead of two ice axes, I had a hammer and a hammer is significantly shorter and you can't rest on it. An ice axe you can plant in the ice and there's a strap that you can you put around your wrist and run a bead down and you can let go. And there's the, the physics of it so that you can hang on this thing. But you can't do that with a hammer because the hammer doesn't have the, the length of the handle and the strap is in the wrong place. So to begin with, by agreement also, and I, I didn't have all the gear, I borrowed and rented gear. I begged, I begged around, even my sleeping bag that I was using that week, I didn't have a deep, deep, deep winter bag. I had to borrow that too. So what this meant was, is that I had to rest a lot more than every single other climber on the climb because we were one team of several. And that meant that by the time we reached even halfway up, we already knew we were in serious trouble because I just couldn't go fast. I had to rest. Um, and so... Had I had all the proper equipments, it would have been a, a snap because I ice climbing, believe it or not. OK, it's it's a safer sport statistically or so it was last time I looked than football. People, fewer people percentage wise get hurt because you have to be careful ice climbing. You have to like super zone in right. on exactly what you're doing and know and know what you and trust your partner. You right. don't trust your partner. It's it's it's, you know, anxiety producing at least and deadly at worst. Mm -hmm. um, so. By the time we reached the top of our climb, 
all the other teams had descended five, 600 feet and left. They're on the way out. The last team was on the way out when we finally sat down at the top of our climb at sunset. So we're hours and hours behind. Scary, wicked, mm-hmm. wicked scary, like mm-hmm. ter- terrifying. And I, w- I wasn't petrified because I could still move. But one of the things I learned about my partner during the, the week before, the reason why I trusted him is because we had some, we had some serious trouble when we were out snow caving, which I don't talk a whole lot about because it's, we got over it. But what I learned from that experience was to trust him and that he had a completely level head and he wouldn't freak. And I, I'm, I didn't freak. I, I, I maintained my, because I'd been trained in the wilderness, you have to maintain your, your, your calm. Cause if you don't, you can die. It's, you know, it, it happens. It still happens. It makes the news, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, people make mistakes and they die. And so that's what we were in that circumstance. And we're sitting up on top of this ledge with our legs dangling over and the sun goes down and the temperature drops like that, like, like a curtain falls, boom. And it's 30 degrees colder than it was. And I, so temperature wise in the climb, I was wearing a, a polypropylene undershirt and long sleeve and a, like a net thing underneath that and a sweater, no, a turtleneck and a sweater and a shell. And I was, I was, I was just right all day but I was also sweating and ice was falling down my neck. So I was wet underneath my shell. And um, by the time we got to the top and the temperature dropped, so immediately all this cold, we don't have any extra thermal. And so we got immediate shivers, not like, oh, I'm shivery and I'm cold, more like violent, uh, like every muscle in my body was was an independent piston, all firing at its own rate just like like you see in a cartoon my jaw was clattering my 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 cheeks were every every part of me was just this a shudder and tim was in the same situation we know we knew we really knew an hour before what kind of deep deep trouble we were in like it became the the slower we climbed the more the intense the understanding of what was really going to happen to us became real did you did you at any point did you just like you know guys we gotta go back we gotta you can't do, you can't head back you can't go down the way you came up oh so sh- backpacking you're hiking and you're climbing a mountain you're you're like oh it's getting cold here and it's raining and i'm miserable i'm gonna go down the trail i came up there's no the going the trail only goes in one direction you can't repel down the way you came up that makes sense um so the it's kind of a built-in it's it's part of the it's part of the magic of climbing because it 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 yeah. and the magic is that it creates hyper focus so it's really good for people who um need to either train into hyper focus or good at it because you got to be right where you are and it forces so, and it also forces you to go through obstacles that you normally in real life would bail out of but you oh, have yeah. no choice if if you don't, then you die, and that is that is the, the magic. That is also magic because you're forced to confront obstacles and challenges and psychological challenges within yourself and break through a lot of those barriers that you would, in a normal scenario, just walk away from. Which is why climbers are sort of a club to themselves, because they all experience all climbers experience that. Uh, there are other places where that happens, but it, this is one of the places where that happens. So. We're sitting in the top of the ledge and the temperature goes down and we're we're, hy- we're beginning hypothermic. And the reason why I talked about being in the ski patrol is because I was working at Bridger Bowl in Bozeman as a, as a volunteer. And we got retrained up about hypothermia because, you know, com- in January that year, there was 50 below on the mountain, oh. 50 below oh. on the mountain. I've been in seven below and I was like, my bones hurt. <laughs> oh, yeah. Your, your eyeballs can freeze. Your eyeballs, oh, my eyeballs, all over the nighttime, my eyeballs started to freeze okay this is like deep deep cold cold and and it feels like putting your hand in a fireplace it's the the it's like it's like you're on fire and and so but that isn't where i was when i first got to the top so we're we haul the rope up tim hauls the rope up the sun's down we're shivering he he, he hauled it up too fast so we had a series of mistakes we hauled up the he hauled up the rope too fast. It became a big knot. I had to take my gloves off in order to sort it. <sighs> and so that began. I have all my digits, but uh-huh. every one of them is damaged. Like every single day, I in the it, 
I live in the in winterland and every single day in the winter I wear gloves I wear a mask I was I was deep into maskness before mm -hmm. it, it was vogue okay mm -hmm. or chic because I, I have frostbite all over my face so if I go outside in the winter time I got to cover up everything and so I took my gloves off I entangled this thing in the dark uh, sun goes down I can feel rope I'm good at I'm very tactile and so I could untangle this thing without really seeing what I was doing but we had this conversation about survivability uh, we knew and this is like to, to say this we knew we were going to die doesn't encapsulate what the a rush of emotions and realization was inside of us at 21 years old um, because it we we discussed snuggling up against the face of the rock because this there's still like 8,000, 9,000 feet above us. We're not even that far up the mountain. Um, we're just up this climb. And um, we realized pretty fast we would not survive that. We, would, we didn't have enough body heat between us to last two hours, let alone the night. So, so the only- So, so okay. you already, so you are already coming to grips in your own mind that this is the end for you. You oh, have yes. that, you're having that conversation in your head at this point. At twenty yes, and at, with at twenty one, <laughs> right? And with Tim, I mean, it's not just in my head. This is like you're both together. You're connected. <laughs> yeah, it's reality. It's like so. So it, that alone, okay. So facing that one thing alone, a person who faces their mortality when they're young really faces it, um, even if they don't die. That's still a life changing sort of thing. It makes you set you out of your peer group because no, like I was that morning, I was invincible. But by the end of the uh, when the sun set down, <laughs> I was a different person. Mm. How did it change you? Just out of curiosity. Well, um, I, I, I break it into two parts. I break it into the trauma of the night, just the emotional trauma of of driving myself forward through darkness on ice and trying to survive. So there's this, there's this willpower that I, uh, I was able to tap into that I didn't even know that I had, which I still have. So there's a benefit to this, but there's also the, there was the trauma of the fear. The fear grew all night long. The colder I got, the closer I came to death. Death was like this far from me. It was like this far from me. And every step of the way, it got closer and closer and closer. It was this, uh, well, it was terrifying. So that terror, that trauma, I had trauma from this. And mm -hmm. I, I, didn't, I didn't actually get over it till 2016 when I went back. But, so the, mm -hmm. but the real after effects of this night came from dying. And, and not only facing my mortality, but I, I went, I, I was carried out of myself into a realm of no thingness. Of, of, of illuminated darkness and, uh, and infinity. And I wasn't even the thing anymore. I, I, I don't, from the moment that I came back, from the moment that that happened, but once I became a human again, I, I can't ever escape that. The biggest change in my life going forward is knowing who I am and where I'm from. And I'm not from here. Mm. And you walk around saying you're not from here to people. Well, we, you know, it's the, it's... <laughs> Not good for your, not good for your career. If you not said, good for your career. not right. good for not so much for the career. So not all right, so uh, so you're walking on the side of this mountain, freezing, and what's the moment? What is the moment that you are now gone? You you've left the body. What happened at that moment, and where did you go? So I was. Uh, we were on our last rappel. The rope was stuck. I went through the final stages of hypothermia and the very last one, the last two, and I'll talk about those two because they relate, uh, sleep, you fall asleep. But when I would fall asleep, it would be like a shut off of a light switch. And I would collapse and, and, and hit the rock and wake up. I was strapped into the mountain at this point. I was attached to the mountain. So I wouldn't fall. And so then I would stand up and, I, and this last time that I stood up, I got tunnel vision, which is the, last, the very last thing that happened. And so tunnel vision collapsed. And as it went black and I was confused, I was just like, what is this thing? And everywhere I look, I see this narrowing of the field of my vision. And then when it closed, I didn't black out. It just, I became, I was somehow more awake. So, and I didn't know what was going on. I, where the mountain should have been, there was an opening of infinite darkness. 
And instead of feeling pain, I, that's what I was, I'm not in pain anymore. There's no pain. And I am feel like I am separated from my body. I'm somehow still connected to it, but I'm not really, huh, it wasn't me anymore. And so I am, I am looking out into this infinite darkness and way far, extremely far further than, uh, you know, the size of the universe is 13 billion light years, like that far away, there's a tiny star appears. And this tiny star rushes toward me at faster than the speed of light, covers this distance. And as it rushes toward me, it speaks to me, but it's not in language. It's in direct, non-linguistic uh, communication of information and a block. But it wasn't just a block. It was a constant flow. But all the information came in at once, and then it just kept coming. And it, and it spoke to me, and it said inside of me, I'm taking you. I'm taking you. And, but, it's, but it came that I'm taking you came with, with power. I can't describe to you how powerful more powerful than anything that I'd ever imagined before. It's so powerful that it, it, its power filled the entire space I was in, and its intelligence. Its intelligence was, um, it, it, it was immense, and all of this was communicated to me, and I put up resistance against it, all this willpower I had carved inside myself throughout the night, carved, found inside of me, like this genetic thing way down inside my humanness, um, survive, survive, survive. I, I put up my wall to survive and it, it, it just reached into me and took me as if I was nothing, <laughs> as if all, uh, and I, I was then pulled from myself and all of my resistance evaporated. And I was, all these things happen at once. I, this is all in timelessness and all of it's in metaphor because, because it's full of paradox. Mm -hmm. So I am, I am inside of this entity, but I also can see myself inside of this entity. So I'm out here somewhere, but I have no form out here. I'm just like seeing this. Your, con I, your consciousness, your awareness, if you will. I'm my awareness, if I will, is observing, witnessing what's going on. But I'm also simultaneously inside this thing, inside what is maybe a light body. Uh, it's, 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 it's not an astral body because... I, I, I had I had form, but I was detached. I was not I was not attached anymore. It was a it, I've had mystical experiences as a child, and there's always an attachment, a root back. There was no root back, and so I'm inside of this entity, the angel, the angel I know. I know this light being, this energy, intelligence, because I'd met it before in my childhood, and so I'm now in comfort and it's speaking to me comfort and beauty and love and welcome and i have no agency left i have no power of i can't even move but i don't want to move i just want to be inside this and i can see out through this this orb of energy that th this angel of being this intelligence into this vast darkness and i can see how fast we're going we're whoosh. and then we reach the end or the beginning where it came from and and it either expands into this eternal nature or i pop into this eternal nature but somehow these this eternal nature and this this contained entity of energy is somehow they're similar they communicate this is part of that so i'm now inside this infinite space and in this infinite space i can see in every direction at once and every direction is is infinite darkness and i can see far into the darkness because there's some kind of luminosity to it so it's a darkness that has light and and way far away from me in infinity i can't see the beginning of it i know that i can't see the beginning of it i know i see more i have better sight than i'd ever had as a human and i i come to consciousness as i, I come to awakenedness as I view this and realize that this is me, that I am this energy, this orb of consciousness where my seeing is my thinking, is my self understanding, is who I am and what I am. And I am, and I'd never been Peter. Mm -hmm. I lived in Peter, but that was not me. It was where I lived. 
And so I am this, and I'm ginormous. I am so much bigger than my human body. And I'm like a big sphere of consciousness of, uh, of divine energy. And then all these things happen at once. And I, I, I tell the story chronologically, but there's, but I'm in timelessness. And it's not like just the eternal now. If you meditate and mm -hmm. you drop into that place of silence where the mind stops thinking, and you're in that place of dark peace that's, that's beautiful, it's like that, only it's not just that kind of timelessness. It's all time that ever existed in every direction, inverted, upside down, reversed, flowing like waveforms. It's all there. And so there's this sense of, of immediacy and eternity in combination. And so I, I, I'm this entity and this, this portal, this light appears, this doorway of light. And it's, it's as big as I am, it's much bigger. And it, it calls to me. It has, it has an energy of attraction to it. And it's like I, I describe it in all these different ways. I describe it now these days. I'm talking about it as a waterfall. It's mm -hmm. like a waterfall of light. And, it's, and it has uh, 10 zillion colors in it of every hue and tone and, and all these colors, and they're all white, and they're all colored all at the same time. So it's all this, and it's so beautiful, and I can see the surface of it. It's pearlescent, like, like fish scales shining, and it's flowing, and I can see the depth of it. I can see that it has, like, a, like it has a, a, a substance to it. So I see the surface, I see the depth, and I see through it at the same time, and, and, and it leads into the in, into the infinite it leads into the infinite it's like another tunnel but this tunnel leads into the infinite that was beyond my sight and so i i am compelled i feel this this desire of of the most beautiful thing and i reach for it with my entity with my own beingness i don't have any hands but i have this i have uh, i have some agency and i reach toward it and as i touch it it infills me with all life, capital A, capital L, creator of all life. And it just isn't Earth, and it just isn't our galaxy, and it wasn't just the universe. It was so much bigger than that. It was, it was all life everywhere. It's the energy that pervades, pan, it's, uh, the word is panentheism here in this world, the divine presence inside of everything, not pantheism, panentheism, the divine love that secretly exudes itself inside of all matter and reality, but not just our reality in our universe, but it, it infinitely so. All this love and light comes flowing into me. And as it comes into me, I hear my name called. And in the calling of my name, it's not Peter, it's the essence of the origin of my created being. I know in that moment, it says to me, I am creator, you are a creature. It says to me, and I know that I'm known. I am suddenly, utterly naked. I have no hiding spots. And now I'm somehow more like Peter. And I, and I have no hiding spots inside of this Peter that I carried with me. And so I carry some of my Peter with me. And, and now there's this, this burning love that's with seeing every part of me. And I, I have this moment of, I know that I can't hide anything. And everything about me is utterly known. And I go through a hell. Of, I go through hell, but not the hell. I go through a, a hell where I suffer all of the pain that I gave away in my life as Peter up until I was 21, from the moment of my birth to every single person and every single incident, only I'm not viewing it like or reading it in a book. I'm in that person as they experience it. And I'm in myself, Peter, as I give it to them, whatever it is. And I feel the wash of emotions of, and the, the flood of anger or hurt or, or tears or confusion. Why are you doing this? And, and I juxtaposed to that. So I'm in their experience and juxtaposed to that, I'm in my own experience of doing it to them. And, and I see myself as this big and the, and the reasons were so minuscule and the pain I caused was huge. And so I had this, I judged myself as guilty of causing this suffering and this pain. And I was ashamed of causing it. And it wasn't like, 
I wasn't being judged. This light, this love that was firing inside of me, causing me to experience all this pain that I had actually created. It wasn't new pain, okay? It was pain that I made. And the, 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 it was only speaking to me love. Love and forgiveness and knowledge. I see you. I know you. I've always known you. You've, I lived your life inside of you. I live my life inside, with a capital M, inside of every human being. I see all, I know all, I feel all, I am in you, and, and I love you as you are. I have always known you. I created you. I make you. I am you. I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you. And, and, all, and as I listened with the ear of my heart to the love that was being spoken, I saw all of humanity, and I saw all of the what Christians call sinful nature, the brokenness of our causing pain to other people. Uh, but it wasn't, it was like everybody had the same amount in comparison to infinite purity, in, uh, to the unlimited. We all had the same level of, of universal brokenness that was coded into the, the way the universe functions. Is um, I, I like to say that black holes consume star systems of innocent individuals who did nothing to deserve it. And, and, and viruses kill people. Everything eats something here. Mm -hmm. And it's just the way the whole thing cycles. And so it, I got this communication was, I know that you caused this suffering. It's not your fault. I love you as you are. I made you. I know you. And as I listened, all of the love that was given to me in my life and all of the love I had given away all became the ear of my heart through which I heard this love and forgiveness. And I turned toward it. And as I turned toward it, all of my suffering evaporated. I became immense. I expanded into, uh, I was filled with love, beauty, joy, adoration, awe, understanding, knowledge of the universe, a universal understanding, peace, bliss, paradise, uh, and, 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 and light. And it was more and more and more and more. And I just kept getting bigger and bigger as more of this infinity poured inside of me to the point at which I felt like more of it would obliterate me. And I would fold back into the divine being fully. And as, as so this name that I hear called, I see, I see the origin of myself. I see like I'm a singular photon that's uh, wave and particle form, and I'm superpositioned. So I'm, I am both, I am eternal nature and I am created nature in, in my consciousness. Okay, so, so my consciousness has, a, has a, like an origin of creation to it, but it's everlasting. So it's both these things. And I'm sort of in front of uh, a universe upon universe upon universe of individual photons making up a singular entity. Just ginormous amount of love and beauty, all individuated as, as photons, like a field, like a field of consciousness of which I am made, of which I emanate from as an individuated little tiny photonic self. And only when I'm looking this way, it's that way. But when I see the size of my soul, I get turned and I, my size of my soul is ginormous in comparison to the individual lives I had lived or mm -hmm. were living because of timelessness. I see the length of my nature. I see that I'm created. I see the origin is aeons old. I see the, we the breadth and the length and the depth of my, my consciousness as it had, has lived everlastingly. I see individual, like I'm sitting at a butcher block table mm -hmm. and it's like my, my, myself is the wood and the lives I lived are the thin glued strips in between. They're minuscule in comparison to the actuality of my soul. And I get to see inside, I saw inside two of my lives and one was human and one wasn't. I don't know where I was. I, I had no frame of reference for this place, but it wasn't here. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I understood, I understood myself to be beloved, loved beyond, I can't even tell you. And, and then I sort of came back to myself a little bit more. And I said, am I dead? And the voice said, yes, you're dead. 
And I said, uh, I can't die now. And the voice said, why? And the voice is the entire space I'm in. Mm -hmm. And it's also right next to me, but I can't see it. And it's inside of me speaking to me. It, the whole thing is one big vibrational voice, but it's very intimate. And it says to me, why can't you come? It's your time. Come to us. I said, well, my parents are suffering. Um, my sister had run away when I was 14. It broke my mama, my mom, and my dad, and uh, my family. Uh, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was as if she died, but there was no way to grieve. And um, so it really caused some really pretty serious psychological things that happened. And I said, I couldn't take another child from my parents. Um, and in that instant, I was, I was moved across heaven to this place where like, I don't know if you, you've ever heard of the Higgs boson field, this mm -hmm. where we're right. So it's like the, the, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of poking out of heaven, like my consciousness is sticking out into the kind of the Higgs boson where energy becomes matter. And, and I can see the entire universe. I see all of our universe all of it, all at once, all septillion galaxies. And I am then brought down to our galaxy and brought down to our star system. And I see Earth like in this one sweep, like this. And, and then on Earth is like a hologram. And I see 7 billion people alive. So it's not like a hologram like, like in Star Wars when Leia shows up and it's not really her. These are really them. They're really them in live time living. There's wars and floods and tornadoes and babies being born. Everything on, you, on Earth is going on. I see, and I see Earth is covered in this big, huge foam, like, a, like veils, you could say, but it seemed like it was foam to me. And every human being was moving through it as if the foam wasn't there. And they couldn't see what I could see. And what I could see was inside of the soul of every single human being is this divine photonic light, gold light, the same as me, sparkling like gold. They are exactly as I am. And I know because the voice then says to me, in the way that I love you now, I have always loved you. And when that voice said that to me, universes upon universes upon times upon times spill out into me of showing me the immensity of eternal nature of love it is it is not just our universe it is be so far greater in size and quantity and quality than than i can possibly say but as it filled into me i have always loved you i always will love you you are always my beloved and Everyone is my beloved in the same way. No one is lost. Everyone is loved. And, and I understood that I, all, I was also in healing. So I was healed and whole and well and the end of suffering. All these things are like aspects or facets of love, of hope and joy and adoration and all those things I named. So I'm completely in healing. I'm completely in wholeness. I'm in well-being. And I understand that this eternal part uh, is who we are and that this is our, not only our origin, but it's our destination. And because it's our destination and it's always been our destination, all the suffering and wounds that we suffer in body are temporary and, and, and they end. And we actually live in this other place. I live in this other place. This is where I, this is my own, that other realm. Mm. And so then I see my parents' faces and I see that they're suffering and um, I see the length of their life without me and I see their increased suffering. I see much more brokenness, a greater amount of suffering. And then I see their lives with me and I see less suffering. But at the end of both of them, at the end of both of those possible probabilities is that they are, I see both of my parents in the well-being that I am in. So I know that in the end, it ends well for them, like it does for everyone. And um, then... How did you come back? Well, I understood that. I said, because of all of this, because of your love, um, do I have to stay? Can I go back and help them? And the voice <laughs> said to me, it's your time. And I, and I then asked, I was leaving on a theater tour. I was in a theater company it's out of a university and um, we were going on this national tour. And I said, I'll get this national theater tour thing coming up. And, and I made a promise 
and um, that I would show up for it and not get hurt this trip. And um, the voice didn't respond. And then I said, I haven't gone, I haven't gone all the way into you again yet. And the voice said, no. And I said, well, do I have to? And the voice said, no, why don't you do? I said, well, if, if I get, can I come back here? And the voice said, yes, you can come back here. And I said, well, then I choose to live my life. And the voice said, you won't live your life and shot me out. And as I went, I became denser and denser. And yet the voice was, although I was leaving heaven, the voice, the divine was with me and speaking to me, present to me and gave me a choice. I had a million doorways that entered back into my life and I could see all of them. I could see all of them. And I could see in the center of all of these millions of doorways was one very large doorway of light. It was the white fullness of light itself. And I knew that the divine wanted me to do that. Choose, it gave me the option. But I knew that this is the option of preference. And it was so beautiful and it was so attractive. But as I, as I looked, I saw myself and I wanted to be some of me. And so I chose, uh, I chose a door that was not in the fullness of the light, but off to the side, close because it's so attractive. But not, but I wanted some autonomy. And, and then I got crushed down. I, then I'm through the door and I see all these probabilities of my life. And then I'm, I'm crushed down smaller and smaller and smaller until I'm next to this. I'm, I'm outside in this. I'm like, I, 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 see the, I see the barrier between heaven. I'm in, I'm in the barrier between heaven, this, this more dense region of heaven and earth and I and I'm being screwed in like somebody's got me as an ice screw and they're screwing me into the into my chest and now I'm inside this body and I'm inside this thing and now I have no idea what's going on I, I I'm the first experience is just racked with pain I'm just full of pain and I have no thinking about what's ooh, where or why and are you still on the side of the mountain or have you been still on the side of the mountain? So you haven't, so, no one saved you at this point. You're no still there. Still there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's sometime before dawn. Okay. It's, I don't know how long it is before dawn, but it's a whole night, a whole winter's night near the Arctic, a long night. And so I sort of, my brain starts to come online. Mm -hmm. and it reboots it re reboots <laughs> that's it, right it, it, it it's reboots. Reboots. And, that, and that's the first wash of pain but that's just the beginning of the reboot now the systems are kind of coming back online again and i start to hear and i start to hear sound and i start to feel motion and um and i open my eyes and there's tim bending over looking at me grabbing hold of me shaking me screaming crying screaming and when he sees my eyes open he's like you're alive you were dead you were dead if you died i was gonna die i was gonna die here and he was just in a total you oh know God. after a night of of holding it all together it just yeah. all came out and, sure and so then he gets me to stand up and he's talking to me and i really don't understand what's going on i don't I, i'm still not sure where i am or what i am i'm i understand what he's saying but i'm not getting the context and and I don't, but I don't know, I know that where I was before was actually reality and that this is not reality. This is, this is lowercase r, that was uppercase r. That's, mm -hmm. and, and somehow here I'm in this weird place and then I start to understand and, and I see, and he's, I'm Tim and, and you, you know, and I, I figure out where ice climbing and he's like, pull on the rope and I pull on the rope and the rope pulls free on the first pole. And we descend, and because of the, the location of the of the climb, the tent is in the car, which is right across the Icefields Parkway. So we're we're very close to the parkway. We get the tent out, we put the tent up. Um, because I'm trained in hypothermia recovery, we it has a chimney and a vent in this tent. This is a, this is like the top of the line Arctic tent that he had. So we could fire up the stove inside the tent, fired up two stoves and heated up the tent and heated up water and got in sleeping bags and sipped warm water, warm, warmer, warmest, you know, heated our cores back up. And then sometime after dawn, we, when I, when I, when I judged that we were well enough to get into the car, we get in the car and we fire up the heater and we just sat there getting hot. And, um, and then 
I, I didn't tell you about the how the warden the night before and there's other stuff that happened mm -hmm. uh, the, the warden checked on us and but he couldn't help us and he mm -hmm. thought we were okay he came to check on us in the morning wondering whether he had to get the bodies wow and then on the on the ride home we totaled the car hit a, semi, <laughs> hit a semi and that was after being in jail so we got that night we ended up in jail for a period of time why did you go to jail uh we sped through this tiny town and um after after you're going through a near-death experience yeah well i wasn't driving tim was so we were driving we're, I'm, I'm asleep and we're we're he's driving through this tiny town and um we get pulled over Jeez. by the mountie and the mountie says uh you know here's a ticket for speeding um oh you're americans you have to pay that fine now and we're like we're not paying that fine now that's you can't make us do that he said oh yeah actually americans skip out on their fines so i can make you do that uh you're under arrest Actually, he didn't know. I don't think he said those words. I don't think he said, you're under arrest. He said, you have to come with me. I think that's what he said. So we got in his cruiser and uh, they locked us in jail until we ponied up money. And we paid him through the bars. We paid the fine cash and they brought us back to our car. And then we're driving and and I wake up and, and Tim's on the wrong side of the road and there's headlights coming toward us. And I convince him at the last second that he's on the wrong side of the road. He swerves out of the way and I'm like, oh my God, you just nearly killed us. And I fall asleep again. And that happens again. I wake up again and there's another vehicle. He's on the wrong side of the road. And I'm like, you're on the wrong side of the road. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, you're not. And this time I grab the wheel and I jerk it. And as I jerk it, we fly off to the right-hand side. And then we go back to the left-hand side. It turns out he was right and I was wrong. And that we missed the front end of the semi by like six inches. Time slowed down. I had a life review like, like Jesus. a movie. Like I see my entire life in front of me, cassette text, te they're flying in slow motions and he's screaming and I'm screaming. And we're like, we could feel bouncing on two wheels. We're like on two wheels and we're on two wheels. And we missed the front end and around the backside and slam into the rear wheels below the car part. No, we didn't get hurt. I got, I ended up with a cut on my hand, but I, I ended up with a stutter. And the story goes on from there. Oh my um, God. I mean, <laughs> listen. Listen, I, I mean, I feel like I just had a life review uh, <laughs> after that, ex that, that experience. Jeez, man. I mean, what, what can be said about an, uh, that? I mean, I'm almost speechless because from the experience of on the side of the mountain, you die, you go through everything you went through, then you come back out and, and kind of like life. Or the universe says, oh, you wanted to go back in. Okay, I'm going to give you go back in. You're going to go to jail that night. You're going to have another near-death experience. You're almost, you're going to crash into something. This is all within a 24-hour period. I mean, the amount of psychological stress and trauma that that must have happened on a 21-year-old mind. It broke me. I, I have to believe it had to, have, I mean, because one of those things, one of one of any of those things that you just said would break most people. So how did you just deal with the psychological ramifications of everything that you went through in that 24 hour period? Well, I, I dealt with it in a bunch of different ways. I, I suffered post traumatic stress from the whole thing, right? Sure. Um, I immediately most immediately i didn't deal with it well I, this theater troupe that i was leaving on this national tour with was in sign language mm -hmm. so even though i had a stutter i didn't have to actually ever speak verbally mm -hmm. and that i didn't get over my stutter until i was in college i mean till i'm sorry till i was in um after two years later i got some advice on how to if you ever stutter just stop talking this guy told me he's a stutterer i just stopped talking and the stutter stops and then I start up again, super easy. Um, but I didn't know that at the time and it was in sign language. And so I, we go on this national theater tour and I removed myself from all the people in the van. So I sat in the back of the pickup truck, 24,000 miles with my sleeping bag and my bed by myself meditating. So I, I knew I had begun my meditation practice in high school and it was called centering prayer practice out of Theravada Buddhism and um, mystical Christianity. And I happened to, I went to a Catholic school and I happened to be near the monastery and, mm -hmm. and certain things had happened in my life and I got exposed to it and I became a, a, a devotee. And so I, I already knew about the interior world and, and I, 
I was so disrupted in the exterior world. Everything to me seemed to be fake. I was like living in a two-dimensional cartoon with flicker and black and white. You know, mm -hmm. how the old, the old ones, the, nothing was, was so, and I couldn't tell anybody. I didn't know where I'd been. So I found that I, I dealt with it for most of my life um, through meditation and Kriya Yoga. Kriya, Kriya Yoga combined with Hatha Yoga and centering prayer practice. And um, I, began to, I began to understand almost immediately that I couldn't rely upon the world, that I had to rely upon the divine energy that came back with me. If, if I relied on the world, I, I, would, I, would, I, I don't know what would happen to me. I, I was not surviving with that. And so I, I aimed my eye inward. Oh, I always use, I love doing this analogy for people to kind of get an idea of, and, and I think this illustrates what you're feeling, that we hear, um, imagine if you're watching a movie, uh, and I'll use Silence of the Lambs as an example. And we all know Anthony Hopkins is Hannibal Lecter, okay? And Jodie Foster is Clarice. And the insanity that we are in as the 7 billion people on this planet is that we believe we are the character. We believe that we are the character and that the scene that we're in is reality. But the truth is that we're Anthony Hopkins and Jodie Foster, and this is a set, and we get to walk away and go home. Home being source, home being heaven, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, thousand and different names. Thousand different names. But I always love using that analogy because it really makes it crystal clear because imagine if Anthony Hopkins walked into Hannibal Lecter and forgot he was Anthony Hopkins. And all he did was think he was Hannibal Lecter and refused to leave. And everything around him was like, no, 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 I'm Hannibal Lecter. I eat people. This is what I do. I'm a bad guy. And Clarice and Jodie Foster, the exact same thing. Imagine if that was the reality, but that is the reality that we are in day to day here. We believe that we are the characters that we're playing on this stage, as, as Mr. Bill Shakespeare said many, many years ago. Uh, and I just thought, when you said that this all seems fake, I'm like, well, I'm in, I'm from the movie business. So I know what fake worlds are. That's what I did for a living. I build fake worlds. You tell fake stories to kind of, you know, you create an environment. So I understand that from a visceral level. So when you said that, it just clicked, it just, it, it connected me with that analogy that I like using. And what do you think of that, by the way? Oh, a hundred percent. And I, the, a difficulty, a difficulty is, is that I know that I'm, acting. I know I'm an actor. <laughs> and so I, I had to actually, I, one of the coping mechanisms was masking. I learned to mask. I couldn't be as, a, I'm very eccentric. Mm -hmm. uh, I make all sorts of decisions that other people wouldn't make based on what I know, where I'm from and who I am. And, and some of those are risk, risk taking things, but they usually, when I take risks, it's, it's mostly other than when they are for fun, but very calculated and careful. Um, but well, I take other kinds of risks that are, involve other people um, for the sake of them. And so I've made a whole series of choices in my life, which have created a lot of drama in my life, but I've saved a lot of people in my life. And so the, the, the living out of it, the living through this lens um, makes me, well, I was lonesome for a long, long, long time. I kept it a secret for 20 years. I lived in this space every single moment of my life and told nobody for fear of loss of career or, or relationship or, or, you know, so, or ended up at an institution. Um, I know, I know, I see, I, and I can't not see. It's always inside of me. It's like, it's like, um, it's always on inside of me. It never shuts off. I can intensify it. I've, I tried to run away from it, but I found out I couldn't run away from it. There's no, I can't leave it. It's, it is what it is. And so I found that the only way that I could, the best way for me to mask was to dive ever deeper in. And the deeper I dove inside myself, the more stability I had inside my, my true nature, the easier it became to, for me to uh, live in the world and not need to tell anybody, not need to share it with people. Um, in order to, and it always came out anyway, it always was leaking out all over the place. I didn't have any, because I was making decisions that other people wouldn't make. Uh, like I didn't go, so I was going to be, I was going to go into the family architecture firm. My dad was president of the AIA in Massachusetts at the time. 
Um, and, and, you know, the big plan was all my life was to go into the firm with my sister and build skyscrapers. And I, I didn't do that. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's over. <laughs> I don't, don't care about it, that at all anymore. Um, I'm, I know I'll go to divinity school and I'll study mysticism at a school where they don't really teach it, but they have high quality standards. And I'm going to create my own path of education for my graduate program. And then I'm going to figure it out as I go along because the orientation of my heart is what it is. I, I, what's it, what's the biggest lesson you brought back with you? Oh, love. Your, yeah. Love. One word, and it's built into human beings. It's mm -hmm. built into dogs and cats and birds and bears. It's love is this, it's the treasure of the heart. And the more you give away, the more you get to keep. And the more you keep, the, the larger your heart grows. The larger your heart grows, the more you hear the voice of the love above, the beloved, the oneness, the singleness. It's all related. Now, your story is obviously remarkable, um, but what's even more remarkable is that you had a second near-death experience. Now, I've yet to speak to someone who's had two. Actually, no, I have spoken to have someone who has two, but what happened in your specific second time? Well, before I say, I want to say that every mystical experience, extraordinary mystical experience, gives it, creates a new identity. So I had a new identity when I came back the first time, and I got a, another new identity the time I came back the second time. In 2015, I had a heart attack. That's, I, was, I was running 5K every other day and uh, you know, cycling. I was fit and family congenital thing, 100% widowmaker blockage, killed my grandfather, killed my sister who had run away. So lots of, lots of things happened. Um, they thought she was murdered and it was a long, crazy story, mm -hmm. but, um, would have killed my dad, but they life flighted him. So I had this hundred percent blockage in my heart. Um, I live in a rural place. And by the time I got to the urgent care center, I, uh, I had already used up my, uh, my golden hour. By the time I left the urgent care center, I should say, I used up my golden hour of survivability. And they put me in an ambulance and drove me an hour and a half to the catheterization lab. And because I live in a small town, um, my son showed up, my wife showed up. Um, I knew the doctors and I knew the nurses and they offered me more. They gave me a trickle through. They gave me some kind of um, injection to give me a, like a decoagulant that created, he said, maybe a 3% trickle through through the artery. Um, and then they offered me morphine, but I refused because it makes me sick. Um, and because I'd had it before. And so I, I, I use meditation to control my pain. And if you've, if you've practiced meditation for a long period of time, you might have discovered that it's a powerful pain control while you're in your meditation state. And I've been doing it for 40 years. So I could, so I'm meditating to hold my pain away. My son shows up, he leans in and says, I love you, dad. And I read him as I see him, I read him, I read his pain, his surprise, his, 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 his disconcertion. Um, and, and is suffering. And my wife is there. And I look at her and I'm like, hey, honey, you know, I've been telling you forever, the first chance I get, I'm going home. And um, I say goodbye to her. I don't tell my son that because he doesn't know that. But I tell my wife that and she's like, okay. Um, and off I go. <laughs> As wives do. Whatever, man. Sure. <laughs> Right. Only, exactly. mar only married people understand this. Right, exactly. Honey, if you're listening, you know I love you. Uh <laughs> right. <laughs> and so I'm in the ambulance. I'm on this long ride and I'm meditating. So I'm very aware of what's going on. I'm still, I'm still, I still can hear everything. And, and at some point, the paramedic calls into the, and I'd been an ambulance attendant too in my life. So I've been in the back of the ambulance as well. And so I, I hear her call in, we're losing him. And I open my eyes and I look at her face and she has fear all over her face. And she drops into her game face as soon as she sees me looking at her. Um, and I, and, but the pain rushes back. And as the pain rushes back, I dive inside myself again to go back into my meditation. I got to, you know, like focus. So I, I, I go back, I close my eyes. And when I close my eyes, I am not in my body anymore. I am outside of my body. I'm sort of like at the, the entry place above my body. 
and it's all darkness. I'm not, I'm not hovering in the ambulance. I can't see the ambulance. I'm inside of a darkness, the same darkness. And, and I'm, but I'm just outside of my body this time. I'm not still in it. And as I'm outside of it, the angel comes back and it, and it comes, it comes very rapidly and it, and it's the same entity. And it says, we only this time it's speaking in the we we it's your time to come home to us we're awaiting for you it's um it's it, all all sorts of pla uh, love like that and and i'm ready to go so it comes to me and it collects me and now we're sort of leaving side by side it doesn't really it doesn't envelop me it's kind of like i'm going up with it and then i think okay wait a minute oh i should tell you before i so I, as i'm lying in the grass having this heart attack um, I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, it's my day. I've been waiting for this. For You're like happy. You're I'm like, like happy. Oh, I'm totally cool. I'm like, I, I, I kind of giggle to myself. It's today. Um, I've been praying for 40 years every day to die, to go back again. And, and I understand. I understand the perspective. I get it. And so I'm going, but I'm like, hey, wait a minute. I know what's going on. I need to check on them first. So I turn back and I look inside myself, inside my life, and I see my son and I see his eyes and I read his pain. And then I think of my daughter who had just, just had a baby and just left an abusive marriage to a, a man who has suffered moral trauma in Afghanistan, bad, mm. bad things. And so she's just escaped that marriage. And now who's going to, and who's going to care for, the, for them? Who's going to take care? Who's going to be the father for the granddaughter who is not even a year old? She's like six months old. And, um, <clears throat> and so I realized I, oh, they're not really ready for me to go. And now I realize, oh, I'm going to go sometime. So I turn back around and I, I go back up into the darkness and the angel entity being of light who had receded comes rushing down toward me. And I communicate, I'm staying. Is that okay? And I turn away and I go back inside. And the next day after I get, I, I get a stent, I have, still have a stent. And um, I went through the surgery, by the way, without any morphine because mm. it doesn't hurt. Um, so it's kind of weird feeling. Um, one of those fun things for me, I was like, oh, that sounds fun. I guess I'll do that. Um, <laughs> the next day I wake up and my room is filled with people, my wife, my kids, my, you know, friends, because it's, a, I'm in the city, and I worked in the city, so I knew a lot of people, and um, I tell them I died, and my son says to me, you know, dad, the doctor told me to say goodbye to you, he said, you were going to die on the way, so I better say goodbye, and my wife says to me, I was surprised you're still alive. I thought for sure you would go. I was already sort of thinking about what I was going to do and making plans. <laughs> but now I got to deal with your monkey ass now again. I deal with you. Gotta, you got to came back now. I got to deal with you. Right. I, I was already in Bermuda. But yeah, now right. oh, I've got to deal with you. Good Lord. Right. We're still married, by the way. We're still married. <laughs> good, um, good. Right. Um, so I, I, I was in television at the time. I was working in TV and my show got canceled after 15 years. And uh, my whole life got into this turmoil all at the same time. My book came out. Um, I had to be in New York to, uh, to uh, a, talk, a morning show um, in nine weeks after the heart attack, which I went to. And then I, my show closed down and I didn't know what I was going to do, but I was a new person. I, I'd, been, I'd been holding back. Um, I came out as a near-death experiencer, like 2002-ish, something like that. Maybe, yeah, something like that, because of circumstances. Um, and then I got talked into writing this book by a bunch of people I was working with, TV people I was working with in New York, and um, who produced my, they produced my book trailer three years before the book was published. That was their bribe. We'll produce <laughs> your book trailer. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Um, so... I came back a different person again. I mean, I'm deeper, more deeply, more truly my higher self. Mm -hmm. And I'm freer now to just be me. How do you, any advice you can give people that want to connect to their higher selves, to want to connect to that inner light that's inside of them? Well, there's a bunch of different ways. One of them is loving other people. 
That's the co most common, easiest way to do that. But it's not just any kind of love. It's a caring love. It's a kindness love. It's a compassionate love. So it, you, can, you can build this in the exterior world through action. You can build this in the interior world through medicine.